Well, first of all, Neil, thank you for doing this. You know Blazers fans, very passionate, knowledgeable, and so I appreciate you taking the time to really speak to them directly today. So let's start with the, the great news, Summer League champions. <laughs> that was so much fun to watch, though. Competitive games. They played great, of course. They won them all, 7-0. Let's start with that. And what did you see in your roster players that really impressed you? Well, one, they won. Mm -hmm. You know, it was interesting. You know, everyone can be cavalier about the outcome of Summer League. And, and we are as a front office. We don't overreact to it. But, you know, if you're going to put the scoreboard on and you're mm -hmm. going to keep score, then you may as well try to win. And our guys went into it with the attitude that they were going into a tournament. Mm -hmm. You know, no different than they've done, whether it was AAU or high school or college. And if they were going to put the amount of work and effort in that they did in the gym here, getting ready for it, mm -hmm. they may as well go win it. And they did. And, you know, look, and as much as I love Rob and Irvin, it's always fun to beat the Lakers. So, <laughs> so that, was, that, was, that was an interesting byproduct after having lost to them last year. It was, yeah. nice, to, uh, it was nice to get a rematch. And it was, what was really nice was to see some guys that had some things to prove, guys mm -hmm. like Wade and Jake. Um, you know, guys like um, Gary and Anthony, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, were kind of unknown. Um, you know, coming into the draft, what they'd be able to do. So what was really inspiring was as much as guys like KJ and John and Archie contributed, our guys really carried the weight, and that, that's really inspiring heading into the season. Obviously, Zach Collins, you know, competing in Summer League as well with that black mask on, which I kind of liked. I kind of hope he continues with that. I hope not, because he couldn't make a <laughs> shot with it, and he didn't miss one in here without it. So we're, we, we're going to get out of the mask as fast as possible. Okay, that's totally fair. Let's talk about positives. Yes. At the end of last season, he said he wanted to put some weight on, get some, some muscles, if you will, and I've seen him. He's done it. What can we expect to see from him in Season 2? Well, I think what you see is a lot of what we saw in Summer League. Um, you know, it's interesting. Everybody's eye goes to the offensive end, especially in Summer League, which is a mercenary-type environment. Everybody's looking to get buckets. And what everybody forgot to notice was Zach Collins was the number one defender at Summer League. 450 players. He gave up .227 points per possession when he was on the wow. floor. It's, it's an insane number. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with how much stronger he is, he can hold his ground in the post, he absorbs contact at the rim with verticality, and he hasn't lost any of his quickness, which is the key. Um, you know, we've gone through this before where guys have kind of tried to change their bodies, whether they got bigger, whether they got stronger, they lost weight, and it's affected their mobility, their strength, and their basketball functionality. Zach actually got better with it. So I was just actually out there joking because, you know, I said just, you know, let's not get carried away. I wouldn't stand too close to Myers because it may, it may bring you back into reality. But, he, you know, maybe, maybe a year from now. So I think his ability to bang more in the low post, hold his ground offensively, you know, I think from a balance standpoint, he got moved around a little bit too much in the low post last year. Um, I think his center of gravity is going to be better, his core is better. And, you know, I just think, you know, just physically, I think guys look at him as a bigger player now because of the weight and the muscle that he's put on. And when we talked about that summer league success, I wanted to ask you how that can translate to the regular season. Well, I think it does. I, I think we've seen it. Um, you know, Terry and the coaches have done a great job of when they've identified guys that are ready to make the jump from mm -hmm. back of roster, practice type players, when they perform well in summer league, and we've seen it many times, whether it's Alan Crabb, Will Barton, Pat Connaughton had a jump, um, you know, guys like CJ. When they've earned that trust in Summer League, it's really done a, they've done a great job of making sure that this, the opportunity was there for them mm -hmm. to prove themselves in the regular season. So I really think it's a great platform to build on. We mm -hmm. have Zach, Caleb, Anthony, and Gary all played well in the summer. They're all going to leave for Coach Gerg's camp next week mm -hmm. in Vegas. Um, which is a great thing that Zach and Caleb are willing to do that again. It's usually mostly for rookies. Yeah. Um, it'll be a great experience for Gary and Anthony. So, you know, Terry will be there. Jim Moran will be there as our coach on the court. Mm -hmm. And every time that those guys get an opportunity to be in a basketball environment and produce at a high level gives the coaches more confidence and trust that they can use them come regular season. We're talking about Summer League a little bit and the young guys. I wanted to ask you just how valuable has Dame's leadership been in his relationship with the young guys? You know, it's one of Dame's great gifts, and I think, you know, one of the things for Damian, being under-recruited out of high school, playing mm -hmm. at, a, at a low to mid-major school, having to stay for four years before he entered the draft, I think Damian really understands the path, you know, that guys have to take, mm -hmm. and he understands it wasn't that easy for him, and what I think what he tries to do is, when he identifies guys that have a like mindset, a like work ethic, yeah. you know, guys that are committed to the organization, that want to be players, Dame gets invested in them really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think he really feels an incumbent responsibility that by him showing up at Summer League, you know, you talked about how important whether it was to win. It was really important for guys to play well 
perform and compete. But I think when guys like Damian show up, when Myers Leonard shows up, when CJ McCollum mm -hmm. shows up, you know, again, we take it cavalierly <laughs> because they're our guys. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We know they're great guys and they hop on a flight. And, you know, how many people are going to, you know, like Damian are going to fly commercial into Vegas to watch guys play summer league? I love it's that. pretty inspiring. <laughs> you know, but I think what we forget is the impact it has. You know, Damian Lillard was an all star when Gary Trent was in high school <laughs> and Anthony Simons was still in high school. And to see a guy like that come to summer league and support them really shows more of a, an organizational commitment than, than the rest of us can provide. Mm -hmm. With one gesture by Dame, you know, and CJ and Myers and these guys yeah. arriving at Summer League tells our guys that they're a part of something. And it's not, well, it's the young guys and then the veterans. You know, I was in the league at a time coaching when you, ha you still had rookie camp followed by vet camp. Mm -hmm. And I think now it's become more collaborative. And I think Damian realizes that, you know, these guys are an important part of the future of the organization. And the mm -hmm. sooner they get acclimated, and feel like they're a part of it, the quicker the transition is going to be, the quicker they can help him out on the court. It really is invaluable, isn't it, to have a leader like that? It is. And look, and we, we talk about all the time how lucky we are, you know, and you see it out there. I mean, when you walk through the gym, we've got seven or eight guys in here working out already. And a lot of that is because when they were here for summer league practice, Damian Lillard's <laughs> in the gym working out. Yep. Let's change gears a little bit. The salary cap spike in 2016. Just how difficult has that made it to bring talent in in 2018? Well, I think it's interesting around the league. I think you're seeing a couple of things. One, teams are very reluctant to give up quality players. Yeah. Um, you know, I think most of the trades you've seen almost exclusively have been cap and tax related, whether it's to alleviate tax pressure, open up cap room. It really, there have been very few player for player trades based on just teams doing business with one another. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is that players under contract at some point have more value than cap room in certain markets yeah. and others Teams are more reluctant to give up quality players whose destinations they control in terms of player retention. You know, having bird rights, keeping your own guys developing is becoming more important because you're seeing destination markets capitalizing on guys. And then the smaller and mid-market teams that are non-destination markets really have to stay more invested in the guys they have, mm -hmm. develop them, make sure they fit the system, make sure they're producing. So, I don't know if it's as much a product of the 2016 cap spike. You know, there are guys that, you know, their numbers are inflated relative to what guys are getting last summer and this mm -hmm. summer. And a year from now, those guys will cycle off and everything will get back to the way normal business is, which three or four teams have cap room, mm -hmm. you've got the mid-level, and teams have to do business with each other. But I think what we're really seeing is that cap spike has put teams in a position where they're less reluctant to manage the cap. Everybody seems very unconcerned about their cap and tax position right now other than the ones that were so egregious or there was an ulterior motive in terms of opening up room to acquire a player they knew would come if they had cap space. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting time in the league because it's been very dormant in terms of player transactions. And as we make phone calls around the league, you know, teams are really less apt to just do business. They're really looking to just keep roster continuity, mm -hmm. develop their players, and kind of look forward going long with guys that they believe they can develop to become a, a long-term piece as opposed to thinking they can buy their way out of trouble with cap room, which mm -hmm. quite honestly is a fool's errand in 90% of the markets in the league. Hmm. Well, going into this offseason, Neil, you had said that you wanted to look for NBA veteran leaders to really help you when come playoff time. Right. We actually ended up getting a little bit younger. Why yeah. the change of plans? Well, you know, the market dictates that. Um, you know, we identified five wings that all had playoff experience or veteran wings. We thought we could get for the taxpayer mid-level. Mm -hmm. They all got more than the taxpayer mid-level. They all got either significantly more or they're in markets where they'll become early bird players or they'll have no state income tax, which adds to the, to the, the value of the contract. So, you know, what we did, what we realized this year was we were going to go through our list. We attacked each guy. We recruited them as hard as possible. When they were able to get compensated at a much higher level than the 5.3 tax mid-level, then we went with talent. Mm -hmm. Instead of continually going down the list and trying to make signings that checked some boxes in July, we went with the guys that we thought had a younger, that had more talent, that had higher ceilings, and were better for the future. Because at the end of the day, that ends up paying off. We've seen it with our own roster, with guys like CJ. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of bringing veterans ahead of him, which all that did was sublimate his development, and we all, everybody in the gym knew how good he was, but because we were trying to appease 
the marketplace mm -hmm. and try to bring in a guy that we thought had a higher level of trust with the coaching staff, we kept a guy subordinate to him for an extra year where we would have been far better off playing CJ sooner rather than sure. later. And I think it's a lesson we learned. And one of the things we realized is the guys that have excelled here are guys, the second draft model players, guys like Mo Harkless, Shabazz, guys like Yusuf Nurkic. They've really excelled when there's been no impediment to their development. Mm -hmm. That when the minutes were there to be earned and they earned them, they were, they, they were able to, to take over those minutes sure. as opposed to knowing no matter how well they played, they were going to hit a ceiling because there were veteran incumbents ahead of them. So, mm -hmm. you know, that said, we were hoping to get those veteran guys, mm -hmm. but they had to be good enough to justify impeding the development of our younger players. So we tried to walk, you know, a, thin, a, a very thin line. Um, we didn't keep going down the list and getting a lesser known mm -hmm. name that really couldn't help us. What we did after we got to a certain point was we realized the taxpayer mid-level had been devalued based on the, what wings were getting in the marketplace. So we needed a combo guard. You know, Terry always likes having a shoot -a shooting combo mm -hmm. that can play on or off the ball with Damon CJ. We did that with Seth. Nick Stauskas is absolutely the prototype of the guys we've had great success with. Really talented, highly drafted. He's been in some difficult situations in the league, needs to find a home. Mm -hmm. So bringing him in, another guy shot 40% from three last year. We needed to add shooting. Mm -hmm. He handles and makes plays. He'll fit in as well. And then we'll just stay opportunistic for the rest of the offseason, looking to see that now that basically every team other than Sacramento, who has about $11 million in room, are out of cap room, our team's going to have to start doing business with one another again to upgrade their rosters. You just spoke on them a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit more about Seth and Nick. Uh, when you looked at them, what really stood out to you? But they, they kind of were under the radar, if you will. And now, of course, they're on your team. You, you know that they are talented. But why do they fit this team so well? Well, I think the un I, I think. Nick was probably a little under the radar in terms of the timing, sure. but we knew we were going to have to fill the roster with a couple of minimum players because we had the tax mid level, we had a couple of minimums. So, you know, I think if you sign Nick on July 5th, mm -hmm. it doesn't have the same, you know, resonance, you know, in terms of the fan base or the market because you do it. But the chronological order isn't, doesn't matter. We felt like he was one of the better minimum wings on the market. Like I said, we feel like he's got the right skill set that can be maximized in Terry's system. He can dribble, he can pass, he shot the ball well from three last year, he's a good athlete, mm -hmm. needs to find a home. So we went out earlier to get him, and then, like I said, we played the taxpayer mid-level market all the way through until about July 5th, and we just couldn't, we just couldn't outbid teams. It was a very defined negotiation. We only had 5.3. It was a three-year deal worth about $16.5 million, and we got outbid, quite honestly. And, you know, at that kind of a price point, guys are going to take the extra million, million five, you know, overcoming to a place that they would have to take a reduction and you can't even offer a starting role. Sure. So, you know, with, with Seth, like I said, Seth had a great year two years ago. He's 100% healthy. He's a big time shooter. He knows how to play. And the key with that position is, as we've seen with guys in the past, whether it's Mo Williams, Steve Blake, Shabazz last year, sure. they have to be able to play with and behind Dame and CJ equally. Mm -hmm. And we think Seth can do that. Uh, looking back to earlier in this summer, Ed Davis is, is no longer on the team. Right. So when you look at the fan base, as you know very well, they really took a liking to Ed, especially last year when he was healthy. So just to kind of explain more to the fans why it made sense, because I know it was a difficult decision, especially with the chemistry he had with the team and just how gritty of a player he was. He was, and, and Ed was great. And it's probably why I was Ed's call at 8.30 the night of free agency wow. asking about, you know, should he take the deal, you know, that was being offered or shouldn't he, knowing where his market was. And, you know, I advised him to take it because I really felt like, you know, players in that category were going to end up taking minimums, mm -hmm. you know, if they waited too long. Going back to what we were talking about, like with CJ, mm -hmm. we feel like we have internal solutions that will eventually be upgrades. And that was the deal. And, you know, Ed is a veteran. You can't bring Ed back and ask him to take on a reduced role. Sure. But if Ed comes back and plays the same role, it sublimates guys on the roster that we think have a higher ceiling and that eventually can bring more to the table. So it's not about development over winning. Mm -hmm. We feel like, like I said, when you watch what Zach Collins did in Summer League, when you watch some of the issues we faced in the playoffs in terms of spacing, in terms of floor balance, because of the style of play Ed plays, mm -hmm. it put us in a position where you watch Dame get blitzed in pick and rolls when he shares the floors with guys. And, you know, we needed to add more shooting, more floor spacing, more playmaking out of that position. So Ed was great, and we talked about it. Mm -hmm. During the regular season, it was phenomenal. We ran into a really tough matchup in the playoffs. They blitzed every pick and roll. 
Um, it, essentially, it took NERC out of a lot of the series sure. as well. And we really felt like we needed to move on and get guys that can play a style where they can attack switches better in the low post. Mm -hmm. They can stretch the floor and shoot the ball when Dame's blitzed if guys aren't going to rotate to the rolling or, or popping or fading big. And like I said, it's not a position anymore, Brooke, where guys are carrying three and four centers. I mean, I think if you look at the market, you have some guys that are making you know, $10, $12 million last year to sign for the minimum. Sure. And so you need one center, you have your starting center, and then you're kind of piecemealing it behind that guy. And we needed to just give an opportunity to the guys that were here. Uh, we feel like they step into that role better and that they bring something to the table we were missing and that got exposed during that playoff series. Well, speaking of, how pleased are you with the terms you came to with Yusuf Nurkic and what can we expect to see from him in his fifth season? We are pleased. Um, you know, I think it was a very generous deal, um, you know, given the situation in terms of, you know, Paul was great about it for Nurk. He wanted to make sure Nurk walked away happy while still doing what was best for the organization. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he was restricted. You know, he had the opportunity to go out and get an offer sheet, but I think he wanted to be here. We wanted him here. But look, it's a tough time in the league right now for bigs. It just is. That's the reality. You know, we're going to more positionless basketball. We're not all trying to be Golden State, but we're also not carrying a heavy percentage of our cap at the center position. Right. So I think for Nurk, I think, you know, timing is everything. You know, two years ago, you're going to look at comps in the market and wonder, mm -hmm. you know, why some of those guys are make, making more. But I think if you look at the rest of this summer, Nurk had one of the more lucrative deals in the marketplace while still being very team favorable in terms of managing our cap and tax position and knowing that long term, you know, that we have him for the next four years, which gives us a really good runway. We're keeping the core together, knowing Dame and CJ have at least three years left on their contracts. And we give that group the best chance to win without impeding our ability long term, you know, in terms of being into a number that's completely non-liquid. You brought up Golden State, so I will talk a little bit more about them. You and I have discussed it before. It's almost a foregone conclusion. They will win every single year. You're saying that. I'm not. <laughs> okay. But. Well, lots of people probably yes. would agree with that. Um, I just wanted to ask you, how difficult is it to balance trying to make moves to improve a roster right away or staying nimble and playing your chips later? Well, I, I think you've got to try and do both. And I think that's what we tried to do this summer. Um, look, honestly, we would have loved to have gotten, you know, a veteran wing, you know, an impact guy that would clearly be the sixth or seventh guy on the roster. You know, it wasn't going to happen in free agency, not with a $5.3 million tax mid-level when you've got guys with full mid-levels at eight and a half and cap room. And honestly, we were caught off guard. We thought for sure the Allen Crabb trade exception would have huge value in the league. And like I said, guy, teams just are not in the business of giving up quality players the way they were because I think everybody understands they're going to have to pay the freight mm -hmm. this summer for what everybody did back in 2016. And there just wasn't as many pieces in the marketplace to do the absorption deals we've seen in the past. And I do think the impact of Golden State is teams weren't as willing to go give up players to create cap room to chase certain free agents knowing maybe it doesn't get you over the hump especially in the Western Conference. I think, um, you know, I think in the West, you're looking at, there's probably 12 teams that are entering the season assuming they're going to be playoff teams. Right. And, and I think we're also all assuming that we're going to have a fight on our hands to go compete with Golden State, who somehow got even better <laughs> with their taxpayer mid-level yeah. and their state income tax. Oh, no. and, and, it, and it's tough. And look, Bob Myers and that group and Joe Lake have done a, have done a great job. Um, and they did it the right way. They did build through the draft, and everybody forgets that. They drafted Steph. They drafted Clay. They drafted Draymond. Um, and then they became the beneficiary of a cap spike, and, you know, KD went there. And, you know, when, when you do that, there's times when a 50-50 call for a guy like Boogie Cousins becomes, if, all right, if I don't have a market this summer and I'm not going to get my big deal this summer, I'm coming off an injury, where am I going to go? If I'm going to go and be harbored for a year, it may as well be with the team that's probably considered – you know, the front runner to win a championship again. Of course, the Blazers would have liked to have gone further in the playoffs the past two years. Why are you confident that they can compete in the playoffs this season? Well, I, you know, look, I think two years becomes a very easy narrative for people that want to look at the negative. Year, the first year was against Golden State. Oh, yes. So we don't get to talk about how, how formidable and unbeatable they are and how they swept every team in the Western Conference that year. And we played without Yusuf Nurkic, other than the game he played where we were up 20 in the third quarter when he was on the floor. Arguably the most competitive series of the playoffs. Of the playoffs. And, and then say that we got swept by two years in a row. So, 
everybody got swept by Golden State that year. Okay, so like that, let's throw that one out. But look, we've talked about it kind of ad nauseum at this point. We did. We ran into a tough matchup, right? You know, necessity being the mother of invention, I think if Boogie's healthy, they're a more conventional team. They go small, not dissimilar to when Golden went small with Draymond. And, you know, Nicola had a huge series. Mm -hmm. We had an elite defender at point guard with Drew. We had an elite defender as a big with Anthony. They blitzed the pick and rolls. Um, you know, honestly, defensively, we were okay. You know, the first couple of games, it was offensively, we couldn't score. It took a little while to get going. But, you know, three of those four games were one possession games with three minutes left. Now, game three, we stunk up the gym. We just weren't ready. We were still a little shell-shocked. It didn't work. You know, Mo and Evan were both kind of trading off injuries, mm -hmm. you know, at that point, which was the wrong series to do it in, right. where you needed positionless guys that could switch pick and rolls. And But like I said, it wasn't that big a disparity between wins and losses. Um, and we did finish third. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you know, so the naysayers want to complain about getting swept in the playoffs, which gives them a platform to do it. The people that look at it positively look at we did finish third. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't get to discount that. And we don't get to discount getting swept in the playoffs. What we have to do is look at, you know, what did we run into with those matchups that were more non-conventional? How do we react to it? Mm -hmm. Well, like we've talked about, we need bigs that can stretch the floor, that can make shots, that can pass out of the high post, that are a threat. You know, we went through this, you know, um, I want to say three years ago, you know, with Mason Plumley. Mm -hmm. You know, series one, the Clippers kept rotating to Mace. Really good passer. Farouk and Mo and those guys punished them for doing that. We beat the Clippers. Mm -hmm. Golden State, watch that tape. Golden State sat back. They stayed on the shooters, forced Mace to finish. We had a much harder time. They blitzed Dame without as much recourse. So that's what we had to learn from that series is we can't put Damian, Damian and CJ in a position where they've got to individually break those blitzes down on their own off the dribble. We've got to be able to get the ball out of the blitz to guys that can make plays or stretch the floor and make shots. So what is your confidence level with this group you've put together moving forward into this coming season, I guess I would ask? We are confident. I, I think if you look around the Western Conference, um, you know, look, LeBron went to the Lakers. He did? Okay? Yes. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think, you know, look, that, that changes the dynamic there. But if you look at the rest of the Western Conference, it's pretty much status quo. Mm -hmm. You know, what teams really did was they signed their own guys. They made sure that they retained their players, guys that had given them success. Well, we, the players that we really felt like – got us to the third seed in the Western Conference that, you know, that produced throughout the year. The, the young guys that we have that we know are ready to take the next step are on the roster, and that's the key. Um, but what we're trying to do is stay opportunistic. And we don't want to say that, look, the roster is done, this is all we're doing. But for now, the key was keeping as much young talent on the roster as possible, filling needs where we could, even if it was kind of margin-type plays, without breaking up. You know, our top six, seven players are still on the roster. So when you really look at, you know, especially the way Terry likes to run his rotation, he really likes a nine-man rotation. So when you look at the starters, plus Evan, right. plus Zach getting an increased role, we're at our seven guys. Seth steps in, he gets to eight, and then it's a battle for that ninth and tenth situational minute spot. So really not much has changed, and a lot of it will be continuity, learning the system, and having more young talent behind those guys, pushing them for minutes, knowing Terry has alternatives, whether it's injury, whether guys go into a little bit of a slump. We have more young talent. And at the end of the day, you can play trust or you can play talent. We're trying to get to a point where we're playing more talent than just trust because it has a higher ceiling and it gives you a better future. Well, I just want to say congratulations going into the Hall of Fame at LeMoyne for lacrosse. So if you could just kind of indulge us a little bit, what were you like back in your college days and what does this honor mean to you? You know, it means a lot because of the circumstances. You know, we, uh, when I got to LeMoyne, you know, I went there, it was one of the best academic schools that I kind of applied to. I got hurt senior year, so I wasn't going to play basketball. John Beeline was there. You know, I considered playing um, and then I was failing PE. Well, I never had to take PE in my life because I was always on a varsity sport. So the lacrosse coach at the time was putting a team together. He had half the guys had played in high school. And then he ran around at intramurals and PE classes and basically got a bunch of former high school athletes and convinced them to try and play lacrosse. So our first year was a club team. Uh, we moved to Division Three varsity my sophomore year. And by the time I was a senior, our group was the founding fathers of the LeMoyne lacrosse program, which now has won five national championships, has produced a bunch of major indoor lacrosse players, 
the preeminent Division II lacrosse program in the country in Syracuse. So, you know, going into the Hall of Fame, you know, on behalf of me and my teammates, mm -hmm. you know, and the guys from that group, it, it means a lot because I think you look back on it and realize we were just a bunch of knuckleheads <laughs> that had played high school sports, whether it was baseball, basketball, mm -hmm. football, looking for an athletic outlet. We found it in a game none of us had ever played before, but we grew with it quickly. So I think it's really, you know, validation for that whole class of guys. And, you know, we've all remained really close or my closest friends. And, you know, I think the confidence of having played at that level in a game I hadn't really played before I got to college, you know, inspired me and gave me the confidence that I, whether, even if I hadn't played in the NBA, that mm -hmm. I could have a career in basketball. And it started out as a high school coach and then working with NBA mm -hmm. players and then getting into the NBA. And I don't know if I hadn't had the experience at LeMoyne starting something completely new and unknown to me in the world of athletics at a college varsity level that I ever would have been able to do what I've done to get here today. So it, it means a lot. It'll be a great weekend. I'm, you know, I'm going in. Um, two guys that pitched no, um, perfect games in the major leagues are going wow. in that weekend also. Wow. Um, Ace Deshaies um, from the Astros mm -hmm. and Tommy Browning from the That's Reds. Cool. So, so for a Division II program to have two guys pitch perfect games in the majors and um, you know, I kind of get on a little bit of a pass because I work in the NBA now and they know that. And, um, but going, in, going into the, the Hall of Fame means a lot. And it'll be fun to have my family there and see where I went to college mm -hmm. and, um, you know, have my son see that. It'll, it'll be a lot of fun. Just how highly competitive were you in college? I'm picturing it and you're pretty competitive. Yeah, it, it was pretty psychotic. You know, we, <laughs> um, you know, and I think it was interesting. It meant more myself, John Doberton was one of my teammates, uh, Mike Cameron. Mm -hmm. We, were, we never played, you know, to, John Dobbin was a big time basketball player. Mike Cameron, you know, played basketball at McQuaid mm -hmm. with Tommy Sheehy and some guys there. They won um, city championships. So we became almost more competitive because we had something to prove. So you had yeah. a bunch of guys that I think by my senior year, seven of the 10 starters had never picked up a lacrosse stick before they got to Lemoyne. Wow. Playing against schools like RIT and Hobart and Clarkson and Hartwick, Potsdam, these traditional Ithaca College, mm -hmm. Salisbury State, these big time lacrosse powerhouses that had guys that recruited out of high school from all the top programs mm -hmm. that were all Americans that went to these places, playing against a bunch of knuckleheads <laughs> that just were running around lacrosse sticks. So, you know, so it was interesting that we ended up almost competing at a higher level because it was never assumed we would end up playing anything in college because by the time we got there, yeah. Our basketball, baseball, football days had kind of ended, and then we found this vehicle for our competitive nature, and and it was great because I don't know if we would have survived college without that <laughs> without that structure that Coach Deal had provided us by putting us on a team because otherwise, you know, intramurals would have been you know more of a bloodbath. So yeah. we would have been killing each other instead of playing <laughs> together. But it was it was fun, and you know, and I ended up playing you know afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I stayed with lacrosse for a while at the club level and. You know, I still love to watch it, and now nothing gives me more pleasure. My both my sons played, and oh, cool. my uh, my ten year old played for Lake Oswego this year and had a great time. And oh. and now I start running into dads, you know, that I played against, oh, wow. and and guys that are you know teammates of mine that their sons are now big time high school players that see each other at the event, and you know it's become a much more popular sport. But at the time, it was a real subculture mm -hmm. sport, you know, kind of all New England, mid Atlantic yep. states, and you know mostly academic schools and guys from prep schools and um, you know now it's really blown up and to see the game of lacrosse grow that was really built on camaraderie and competition that's now getting to a whole nother level here in the states that's really pulling guys from football and baseball and to go in at a time when lacrosse is almost at its apex means a lot. Well congratulations on that honor. Enjoy that weekend with your family and thank you so much for taking the time today. Great. Thanks. You're the best. <laughs>